some of the best, I would say, liqueur makers in, in the United States, at least, in the world. Um, <laughs> I, I, we could probably argue, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'm the best, but I'm definitely one of the tallest ones. <laughs> 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 okay that i think that that's a that's a good way to kick it off so I, i'm gonna uh let me see here move to our other side uh ryan and julie aren't here right now so i'm gonna uh skip ahead um so uh we'll head on with you andy uh we'll talk a little bit about stone barn uh the founders are sebastian and erica uh, but we are so proud and happy to have Andy here. Uh, Andy, <laughs> would you uh, like to tell us a little bit about uh, Stone Barn and how it came to uh, its creation and then how you got involved with Stone Barn? Sure. Yeah. So uh, Stone Barn Brandyworks, we are a small boutique distillery in southeast Portland, Oregon. Uh, Eric and Sebastian are husband and wife, and they opened the distillery in 2009, so kind of on the earlier side for craft distilling. And the idea was to make sort of a European style distillery, making pure fruit eau de vie, so fermented and distilled fruit brandies, um, and also fruit liqueurs, so lower alcohol, very intensely fruit flavored. Um, but everything was being drawn from Oregon or Washington because we're right by Washington. Um, and everything is done from scratch. So there was no source spirit, no neutral grain spirit. Everything is distilled on our little custom built, uh, German brandy still. Um, they continued on like that for a couple of years. And in 2011, we started making whiskey as well, because if you work with seasonal fruit, in the Pacific Northwest, there is no seasonal fruit for like six months out of the year. Uh, <laughs> so making whiskey kind of became something to fill in that period. Um, it also gave us a new source of bases to use for the liqueurs. Um, so not just using very expensive fruit brandy as the base, starting to do some grain, literally grain to glass um, whiskeys or grain spirits for the liqueurs. Uh, I started working here in 2012, so that photo that's up is of a much younger uh, <laughs> version of myself. Um, I'm the head distiller here. Um, Stone Barn is a pretty small operation. Uh, there's Erica, Sebastian, me, and Jen, our salesperson, tasting room person, um, and that's it. So we all have a hand in every stage of production. Um, I've worked at several other distilleries, but five other distilleries um, simultaneously. <laughs> so I've seen a lot of different stuff and different approaches. Um, Stone Barn for ourselves makes something like 20 to 30 different products a year, um, split between many different fruit brandies, about 10 different whiskeys, and probably about 10 different liqueurs as well. So big pool of stuff to draw from. And it is, as I was saying before this call started, it is the middle of harvest. Uh, <laughs> there's fruit everywhere in the distillery. Uh, and I'm still kind of wrapping my head around what's going on right now. So happy to be here. Awesome. Thank you. And we have um, the wonderful uh, crew from Whidbey. We have Bev and Steve who started it. And Bev is with us today, and also uh, we have Jonathan. So uh, would you? <laughs> do, you like that photo? I, I, I was. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I, I, Jonathan's got. We have great photos of Jonathan. He's quite. He's quite photogenic. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that photo too. It's very Pacific Northwest, right? Carrying yeah. the grain and yeah. 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 So we started in Steve and I. Um, bought our property we have nine acres here we bought it in 2009 with the intent to open up a distillery just kind of a oh gosh i don't even know how to say we didn't we didn't really have a plan <laughs> we just thought it would be something interesting to do and um the reason we started out with the berry liqueurs is um there was a product that was made in, in the 80s and 90s by chateau saint michel called Whidbey's liqueur and uh, it was a Loganberry liqueur. 
And that's not what we feared we would be doing, but the public kept bringing bottles and saying, you have to bring back the tradition of Loganberry liqueur. At one time, there was 14 acres of Loganberries planted on the island. And so we made our first barrel and kind of reverse engineered from there. And that was our first product was the Loganberry liqueur. Um, and then we uh, decided to add on some other berry flavors. We've been tempted to kind of do different products, but we've really stuck to berry liqueurs. We've got a great formula and um, we like to focus on what, you know, what we're doing with these liqueurs. And then of course we added whiskey in about 2013. And um, we have a farmer that grows all of our fruit for us. Unlike you guys, Andy, we actually have a situation where we can, we buy once a year and then we have our fruit put away so that we can have it throughout the year. And so we're in production of the liqueurs um, every, all year round. Um, we decided to start out with a grape-based um, uh, neutral spirits for the base tar liqueurs, which has worked out really well. I'm going to let Jonathan talk a little bit about our stills. I don't know if you guys are familiar with our distillation process, um, but basically we distill wine right below vodka. So that's been giving us the ability to have a really clean, um, you know, no taste, no smell. Um, and that's worked out really well for us to have so that the berry can just be the star of the um, of the liqueurs. And we actually produce neutral spirits also for our local wineries that they in turn use for um, port and um, dessert production. So Jonathan might talk a really quick about our um, about our distillation process here. Yeah, Steve, go ahead. Oh, no. So Steve designed the stills that we use today and we hand make them on site. So they're completely unique to us. Uh, they're single column continuous stills. So they run 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, but they're all electric. So no open flame or steam. Um, you have, pumps that pump the feed into the still. Um, we have electric heating elements that kind of are the main heat source and everything's controlled by the computers which are hooked up to the internet. So you can actually control them from anywhere in the world we have internet access. Um, but we use kind of a fractionating system where we know the different alcohol molecules want to condense at different temperatures. We have an internal cooling coil that runs all the way down through the still kind of calculated the surface area of those turns to figure out where to place those draws. And so we have a set point for this alcohol that's just under 190 proof and the temperature is held there and it refluxes. So the stills nine feet tall and the draws six feet and just under 190 proof alcohol is coming out at that spirit draw. And we can make 190. That's not, but we try to make it just below vodka for reporting purposes and keeping it simple. <laughs> yeah, when you get that high of proof, the purity allows for a essentially neutral distillate and it's a great extractor. So it's going to pull the maximum amount of flavor and color out of the berries. That's something um, I'd like to touch on because you are unique in that way for one using continuous distillation uh not a lot of uh craft distillers use that uh can you talk a little bit about how that came about so that started um kind of with the whole building and the whole process we started on a 50 gallon pot still and you know steve's running it eight hours a day and trying to get this high proof alcohol out of it and it's you know seven feet tall and just the labor intensity um just yeah, doing can... distillation after distillation and really struggling to get that high proof alcohol yeah. and um knowing that we wanted to run uh wine with all the local wineries on the island um steve kind of looked at it and said it's it's not a viable business um, because we're never going to have any sort of production that means anything. So the choices are, you know, give up 
or spend a lot of money and get a some sort of traditional still. Um, and he went with the third option was to build his own, did a lot of research and put a lot of ideas together. And if he was here, he'd say, you know, he had an idea about how this non-boiling still would work. And it worked in spite of his idea. He turned it on the first time. It put out 190 proof alcohol. And he said, wow. And that, and, and that was the beginning of a long period of reverse engineering what was actually going on inside the column. So we're in a unique space where yeah, we're kind, right back in that room, right? There. Yeah, we're, we're kind of on the cutting edge, but there are also no manuals. So we learn things every day and uh, we try to build every day upon what we're doing. And at the same time, thankfully, we're producing world class spirits. Yeah. And so we are making, we have a whiskey still and we have a neutral spirit. So we we do uh, source, we were sourcing our grain from the island um, with Skagit having it malted. And so one of them is dedicated to whiskey and the other one's dedicated to neutral spirits. Okay, that's awesome. And I can testify, uh, you produce awesome stuff and stuff, just me. Um, <laughs> I believe uh, the Beverage Tasting Institute uh, gave you the highest out of any spirit uh, rating of 98 points. Is that correct? Yeah, that was in 2014. I don't know anymore, but that particular year. And I, I do believe that I'm not sure up to that point that anybody from the BTI in the U.S. or North America that ever had a 98. That year, there was about six of us with 98, no 99, no 100. And, you know, getting that platinum award is kind of, Jonathan can uh, testify to this. What, everything we do, we have the attitude of platinum. And that's how we approach our processes, our production, thinking platinum all the time. Well, you know, in, in 2014, I scored 94 points for my gin. And I thought I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then i see you get an idea I'm like oh wow so but it, it it's it's quite awesome what has happened in the pacific northwest and i'm going to jump to andy here um because you also make some uh pretty phenomenal spirits uh now i know you don't have a, a custom still that's all technologically savvy like like they do but can he's you... like <laughs> No, when you're, 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 you're like the Batman. You're like the <laughs> Batman setup, and um, but uh, and Andy, can you talk a little bit about your setup and 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 how that approach has taken you to making? Uh, sure. Spirit? Yeah. So our still um, is a coat the uh, Bain Marie still with three plates. Um, it was actually the second still that Cota brought to the U.S. Um, and they had not built one like it before uh, is it is an electrically heated bain marie okay. um, there was some figuring to do with that but uh the idea behind the still was to make fruit brandy um so we don't want a neutral spirit we want something that captures the essence of the raw material that we're working with um and the still is really designed for making pear brandy um so the pear brandy, Williams pear brandy or Bartlett's pear, um, is distilled from a whole fruit. So it's mashed and pureed. The stems and seeds are removed, but it's not a cider. It's like applesauce or baby food. Um, you know, it's very thick. Um, and you need the skin in there to get the proper flavor to pear brandy. When you just distill it from cider, the, the quality is very different. Um, but if you're distilling something that thick, um, it can be difficult without a bain marie or a water bath. Um, pear brandy is also typically distilled before the fermentation is complete and there's a little bit of residual sugar left. So if you have a thick mash, a little bit of residual sugar and any hot spots in the stills jacket or how it's heated, you can get cooked notes or scorching or off flavors from that. So the bain marie is a low temperature sort of form of heat it doesn't produce steam. It's at about, I mean, it might produce a little steam depending on how you run it, but it's at a relatively low temperature compared to a traditional steam jacket and much lower than a direct fire still. Um, that lets us get these big, intense, bright fruit notes when we work with, you know, apples or pears or quince or plums or cherries or any of these things that they distill in Europe. 
Um, so we have a pretty traditional approach for working with the fruit brandies, um, you know, very inspired by what they do in Europe uh, or what they do in our backyard at Clear Creek or St. George or places like that. Um, and that was kind of the starting place. Um, we've learned a lot about doing it, but the, the expertise is out there. You know, the information is out there. You just have to really dig into it. Um, and once you kind of get into the distilling side of it, you realize a lot of it is about the fruit. Um, it's about where the fruit comes from, how it's grown, the properties of what you're working with. And the distillation becomes just the tool or the technique to get at the raw material. Um, so our approach with the still and with making the base spirits is for the liqueurs is to do something that is additive to the raw material that we're working with. Um, so both because we can't make neutral spirit on our still and because we're not interested in making neutral spirit, we have to find symbiotic pairings between the raw material and the base spirit. So we make a quince liqueur every year. Um, quince is, I'll grab one in a second, but quince is a very that. aromatic golden yellow fruit sort of in the palm family. Um, it has a very special aroma. Uh, it has a fairly unique flavor. Um, you can make brandy out of it. And so it might seem appealing to make quince brandy as the base for the quince liqueur, but it takes about 15 pounds of quince to make a half bottle of quince brandy. So it becomes exorbitantly expensive to do so. So we thought, you know, what goes well with quince? What is going to not distract and maybe amplify what's already there? And certain varieties of quince have apple and pear notes to them. Um, so we use the apple and pear brandy as the base for the quince liqueur. Um, we actually do, we'll talk about it more later, I'm sure, but um, we do an additional distillation of the fruit macerated in the apple and pear brandy. So we take quince, cook, and, and then macerate that in the fruit brandy, and then we redistill it again. Um, so we have actually like a quince scented apple and pear. Um, so it becomes from just fruit <laughs> you know you're trying to build complexity with what's there um without adding discordant notes so that's yeah that's our approach i guess that's awesome now i know something unique and and you just both said that you use electricity so that's kind of unique because i think most of us have steam set up so maybe i need to switch to electricity i don't know <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, it, you know, kidding aside, uh, there there are a few things I know when I started out that um, you kind of have uh, I guess a a decision point. You know, are you going to buy neutral grain spirit, which is much cheaper to do, or are you going to head off and make your own base? And I know everyone was telling me, you know, you gotta buy it to make this business work. You gotta do this and. And I was like, no, the flavor isn't there. Or, you know, I, I if, if, if it's a palette, I'm, I, I need my own canvas that I'm building versus, you know, having it supplied to me. So um, can you tell me why it was so important or what was the point that made you decide, OK, this stuff is cheap and we could use it, but, you know. Um, so. For us, you know, that was the decision the owners of Stone Barn, Eric and Sebastian kind of made. Although I think initially it was not really a decision. Um, it never, I don't, <laughs> in talking to them, you know, over the last decade, it, it, I just think they never even considered it. It never occurred to them that you might open a distillery and then buy alcohol. Um, to me, it makes perfect sense. Uh, and, you know, I think there's lots of valid context for doing so. Um, you're not, I mean, you're not really limited with what you can purchase if you apply some creativity to the sourcing process and who you work with. Um, so I, I think it depends on your desires and application. I think because that was just how we started. Um, it became a limitation that created creativity with the products that we make. Um, because we have to come up with a spirit for each one of these, whatever, 10 plus liqueurs that we make. And it has to be something we distilled here. Um, 
so we come up with unique combinations and it's led us to like, we were interested in making a peach flavored liqueur with Oregon peaches. And we tried a few different things and the base that made the most sense production wise for us to use was rye whiskey or rye spirit. Uh, and we tried a few formulations of it. And eventually what we realized was we actually like rye whiskey just flavored with peaches. Um, not something we would have done you know, organically, but we had these peaches that we wanted to work with. And because we needed to come up with something, uh, it pushed us in one direction. And now we make peach rock and rye. So we make a rye whiskey that's essentially barrel aged with peaches. Um, and it's like our second biggest selling product. Um, people love it. In rock and rye, you're probably one of the, what, five distilleries in the world that sell rock and rye? <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Uh, and the or the, the reason for doing it is because we wanted to call it peach flavored rye whiskey and the TTB wanted us to put uh, with natural flavors added uh, rye whiskey with natural flavors added. And it just doesn't I mean, the natural flavor is whole peaches, right? It's not an extract or, a, you know, tincture or something like that. So it just didn't have the right vibe for the farmer's market. Uh, and you know, shockingly, there's no rules for what you have to say on peach rock and rye. As long as you put a little bit of sugar in there, uh, to be <laughs> rock and rye, it's kind of any good. So that was, that's why we did that. And people like it. People like to say it. They don't know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's kind of our approach. I mean, I think I, I, we have found benefits from making the spirit ourselves in terms of the creative process and the flavor combinations and the connections we make with, you know, growers, but uh, it's not the only way to do things. And it's not explicitly the best way either. Um, How about you, Bev? Well, it's, um, I think maybe it's because of the way we started. Um, my husband retired early and he's like, I want to make something. He was in the defense business. He's like, I actually want to make something from the ground up. And, making our own products been really important to us. And we've, we've gone, <laughs> we, it's, it's a, it's a challenge to make your own spirits. Um, um, and the story came to mind. We even went as far as having grain grown at the Pacific Rim Institute. We had rye grown and we had the plow horses. <laughs> we, they planted the grain and we actually plowed it up with the horses. It's like, that's going a little far. <laughs> um, but I, um, yeah, we have never considered buying distillate. We, I think it's because we are in the craft of it. And as we grow, it's been a challenge because we're growing and, you know, we've done really well and, you know, it's tempting to go the other way, but we have, we have um, five employees and we're so fortunate because they're all around Jonathan's age here and everybody's so enthusiastic and they have such a passion for the distillation part of it. And Jonathan has just recently become our, our master distiller, you know, kind of Steve's kind of handed the hat down to him. And, um, you know, part of it for us is these guys growing and learning a trade. And um, yeah, so we we're really proud that we make our own, we distill our own product. <laughs> we have a lot of fun messing around with different things. We just made a barrel of brandy too. Um and we have all these little experimental things put aside. Uh, we've added, we have an orange boysenberry liqueur now that does really well. And, um, but yeah, we just keep coming back to that neutral. We have talked about doing a rum base, with kind of playing around with making a, a distilling rum instead of wine uh, to see how that goes. Um, so, and we did just release our first batch this year of rye wisdom so this is our four-year aged um rye whiskey and we came up with the name rye wisdom which has been really fun and went with a whole different packaging idea and um that you know again putting whiskey away for long term when you're making your own product and have to wait four years for it to sell that's <laughs> um but we're glad we did it i love the name and uh, I'm so excited to have uh, Ryan. Uh, Hi, Ryan. <laughs> uh, Ryan, I'm actually going to try to cue you up.
so you can talk a little bit about um the distillery let's see all right can you hear me too yep yeah you sound great okay it's good um let me see am i sharing the right screen i think it's are we are we seeing you and your uh, lovely wife? <laughs> that is Julia and I. Yes. Okay. So, right. so, so and that was yeah. actually we did this. <clears throat> that photo is from uh, the Everett Herald, so a local paper. Ran a little article when we started doing cocktails in the tasting room. I thought that was a great photo. Uh, when, I was, was... when I was putting this together, you know, yeah. I was just looking uh, online and and trying to get. Uh, get some accurate represent representation i think uh won all these gold medals on on your bottles i think um so uh the the rest of the group had a chance to uh talk about how they got started and, and why uh taking on the extra task of making your own base uh, why don't you just give us kind of your origin story and, and catch everybody up uh and then share about uh, some of the special things you've done, like your Nochinos and 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 also your other liqueurs. Yeah, yeah. Sorry too about being late. My my laptop totally crashed and burned, so we had to quickly update and set up my wife's laptop for this. So it just it took a little bit. <laughs> One of those unexpected things. Um. <clears throat> so just some kind of brief history, I guess. You know, too. We started in two thousand nine, um, licensing and. Started distilling in, I think, maybe 10 or uh, probably about 2010. Um, I've got a, I did a two year winemaking degree as well from WSU and that finished that in 09. And it was like, you know, we like spirits more. We like the opportunity for education and uh, not, um, experimentation and just looking at different things. And there was a uh, little, little out there. So we jumped in and um, products like you mentioned, like the Nochino. Um, this was actually, we started, I started making this in 05, um, but we have got big walnut trees. My wife said, do something with the walnuts or cut them down because they were shading the vegetable garden. And so I've been to Italy and wanted to try different, um, making something with that. And it was, I remember when I started making this, like the first batch, uh, did research online and I did about eight different mason jars of uh, recipes. And the next year was five. The next year was three. The next year was, okay, this is the one we really like. And so we narrowed it down that way. And that was well before, you know, we had the distillery and ability to bring in bulk product or anything like that. So we started making it with what spirits we could buy. Um, and we, I mean, we kind of talked about uh, the different bases. Um, and so like the Nochino, um, we've utilized, uh, rum, we used, uh, a little bit, just a little bit of NGS, um, but, and then brandy and the rum kind of really does make a difference with that little light vanilla note in there. And it sweetens it up just a hair and it makes a difference. Um, and we really enjoyed it. We're working on that one. And then, I mean, we started, my background too, is I did economic development for agriculture. So I had a decade of um, working with local farmers and working in Washington State, uh, but also really close, Snohomish County, Skagit, Wadcom, Pierce. And so working with a really, really good ag base um, was, is kind of really, was really key for us. And so like, you know, we had another product, our Spice Apple, these I just pulled from our home liquor cabinet. This has been enjoyed a little bit. Um, and it's uh, when we started, like, I started working with these farmers that had extra product. And literally, I've known this farmer for probably 23 years. Um, and I was, my wife and I were just up at his orchard uh, two weeks ago in, in Sultan. And he's got a nice little 15 acre orchard. But we started working with them. And this, we actually, before we could get um, bulk products, so we we changed from a craft license in Washington State. There's two license types, craft and a general. Um, we're a general distiller now. When we started, we were a craft. And that meant we had to distill at least 51% of our, um, our base. So when we started this one, we used a corn spirit that we would 
uh, ferment distill and um, and everything. It's basically it was 100% corn at the time, and we've actually we have switched and we're we're very open about what we do for liqueurs and, and crafting. I mean, this is a now 100% NGS based. Actually, what we still have actually the product now is still I, I take it back. This one has not been switched to an NGS. It's still working on um, some of the past product that we made because uh, we're able to get good yields off corn. It worked well that that time. Um, but products like our raspberry liqueur and uh, like our blackberry or coffee, those are utilizing um, NGS, truthfully. Um, but that the reason why we want that is just more of a, a, a pure, clean slate. Um, I've taught classes where, with ADI actually, we did a gin class many years ago, and um, it was kind of fun because we then we took three different gins and used it as a base of a liqueur, um, and just really described the what your your base spirit can really um, influence and and guide. So like the Nocino with the herbal notes. Um, the bitter notes, things like that, the utilizing the rum, just really just, it just works so well with it. Um, I've, we've really enjoyed it. It gives it a different um, texture, almost mouthfeel compared to like an NGS. We played with NGS, definitely didn't like where it went. Uh, it was just too clean. It was too, we lost a lot of the nuances. And I think that's what you really get with a um, a handmade base that is a little different than a, you know starting with a clean slate that's awesome i don't know what, it, it, awesome. It, yeah and sorry just kind of jumping in after fun doing technology issues i apologize <laughs> no no worries we're, we're glad that you're here um so the thing that i was uh, also interested in is is a couple weeks ago i i did a kind of intro to liqueurs i was talking about the actual marketing and uh market share that liqueurs have and the uh the growth rate is actually quite impressive mm -hmm. although the overall market is small the growth rate is pretty great so can you talk a little bit about how you feel uh that is from your distillery perspective and, and cash flow yeah. in your future. And, and this is for all the panelists too. So, but hop in, Ryan. All right. I'll, I'll kind of jump in there. Um, I think the liqueurs kind of give somebody, um, it's not, it's not as scary of like, if you're in the tasting room, they want to try a little tasty, the spirits. It's not as scary as like uh, an 80 proof rum or like, or a rye whiskey. Um, it's like when we do wine walks in our tasting room, raspberry liqueur flies out the door. Um, I mean, our raspberry liqueur, World Liqueur Awards, we've taken top fruit liqueur in the entire world. It's been top uh, liqueur in the United States a couple different times. Um, and and our, I think the um, our approach to it is it creates a really nice modifier for cocktails. Of course, it can be enjoyed on its own. But... Um, I think it's definitely has got a lot of growth going forward. Um, I think, um, uh, well, this might be, I think a lot of the, the, the new seltzers and such have in a way though hurt the liqueur market in some regards because the cocktails that like using a raspberry to make like a, I mean, a vodka raspberry lemonade or something like that. And, and so that what someone would do at home, I'll be honest, I think that there's people are looking at um, other other avenues, but we are definitely seeing increase. I mean, like all of us right now, we just the raspberry liqueur for us is just like it's continued to step up and increase in sales, uh, which has been great. Um, all of our fruit uh, is Washington based. It's all um, the juice and berries and everything are all from Washington farms, um, and so for us, it's really important to be able to kind of we're able to tell that story too. And I think people, uh, if you can truly give them an authentic story and authentic experience, authentic product, uh, it resonates with a lot of folks. And so when we make cocktails in our tasting room now, we're able to talk about that. And when the biggest thing I think is, is trying to communicate like uh, what people are, you know, what you're offering them is real, is authentic. And uh, the growth does go from there. I mean, like would be, I mean, we've, 
it's kind of fun because I know we, we end up sharing a lot of same customers that come through our place and they love their stuff too. And it's just a lot of fun to see. And, you know, even the different styles, we can all make a raspberry, we can all make a blackberry, but there's just little different tweaks that we do. And um, it's been pretty neat to see that too. And everyone's like, oh, I like my little sweeter. I like my little dryer, more tart. And they find a, what you know, a liqueur that suits kind of their need. And as long as we all collectively can um, outperform and outshine the big brands, which isn't that hard, <laughs> it's, I think we got a lot of opportunity. Bev, what do you think? Yeah, okay. I, I think in we, when we first, um, you know, when we first started making the liqueurs, it was really a challenge on uh, how do you market them. And I think, um, you know, we've had to kind of do the same thing. We we feature a lot of recipes on our website and just finding that you kind of do have to tell people what to do with the, even though standalone you know, when they taste it, we have so many times that people come in and they say, I don't want to taste liqueurs. I just want to try the whiskey and we go, well, why don't you just have a little sip? And if you don't like it, you can dump it. And I, I mean, you know, Jonathan can, can attest to this. I have still not had maybe in 10 years or no, we're on 13 years 13. of doing this of somebody saying, I don't, you know, it's just too sweet or whatever. They just like, wow, I'm shocked, you know, <laughs> and I think it's just educating people and, and our bartenders too, you know, for on-site and off-site, we have some great, um, um, you know, bars that we're working with now. And, and it's um, just so fun to see the creativity. So we, we market ours as that secret ingredient to any cocktail. You would put them in pina colada, a mai tai. You can put it in a mojito. You can margarita. Um, and so I think it is educating the public, letting them taste it, of course, and then saying, here's what you do with it. Um, we kind of shy away from, we, we were doing many cocktails for a while, and it's so tempting to get into the cocktail business because we can. Uh, but we really try to focus. We're open every day. We're open seven days a week. We're in production seven days a week. And, you know, our, our thing is to let the customer get that taste and let them go home and play around with it. <laughs> um, you know, we try to stay focused on what we're doing. Um, but we have fun making cocktails. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I can say, you know, from my perspective, I was definitely one of those people when I walked into the distillery, I said, you know, I want to know everything there is to know about making whiskey. And they said, yeah, we make these liqueurs too. And I was like, man, yeah, no, all liqueurs, yeah, okay. <laughs> and I tried them, of course, and I was like, oh, this is different. This is a different thing. And so, yeah, that educational piece and, you know, having the luxury of having a, a tasting room and being able to hand educate people and hand sell those bottles, big deal. Yeah, I think that's what kind of plays into what I was gonna say, which is making little cures and marketing them. There's kind of the double-edged sword that you encounter, which is it is a pretty crowded competitive space um, for certain types of liqueurs. It's a relative, I mean, there's 2000 whatever distilleries in the US now. Uh, it seemed like for a little while there's probably 1800 coffee liqueurs um it's a, <laughs> a low bar for people to make one and they are popular people like them you know so the more kind of commonplace and mainstream the liqueurs you make are you know the easier time you may have at the first flush people come in and try a coffee liqueur they what coffee liqueur is i like yours they buy it when you try to put that into distribution or into retail or get into bars there's it's totally saturated the flip side of that is doing something unique um you know making something that's off the beaten path um where there's not as many entries or there are no entries at all um but the flip of that is you have to do a lot of education and that might not be viable um, you know, at retail or in distribution. So we make a Hascap liqueur. Uh, Hascap is a type of edible honeysuckle originally from Hokkaido, Japan. Uh, we worked with a fruit breeder who developed an Oregon specific variety of Hascaps, um, which are now grown commercially. And it's a beautiful liqueur. It's like the berry is inky purple. They kind of look like a stretched out blueberry. People try them. They've never really had anything like it. 
Um, we thought we would do it once because the fruit was so unusual and so expensive. And now it's something we do every year. There's people that come and buy it every year. Um, but it requires telling that story. You know, you have to explain to people, you know, well, we worked with Maxine Thompson. She was out on her mobility scooter, you know, in her 90s, breeding Hascap berries and making them, you know, sweet and delicious and et cetera, et cetera. And they hear the story and they love it and they taste it and they love it. But if you can't tell them the story and get them to taste it, it's, it's just going to sit there. Um, so you have to kind of consider both of those factors. I mean, the liqueur space might be growing, but it's never going to become whiskey because it's not a homogenous category. You know, it's, it's many different things all just lumped together because they have sugar in them. Um, so for us, it's important. Um, we do, we used to have a tasting room. Now it's by appointment only, which was a big improvement for us and how we operate because we're doing production every day. Um, we mostly sell at farmer's markets. Um, and fruit liqueurs are a great fit at farmer's markets. It's attractive to people that don't necessarily drink, but who are interested in agriculture and supporting local stuff. Um, it gives some people something that's more accessible than 85 proof Quinso de V or whatever else, or Grappa or whatever else we would really like to be selling. Um, and yeah, but it, it, it's not the, the rocket path to success. It's, I think, a component uh, that fills out a portfolio in a nice way. Um, and yeah, um, you hit, yeah, go ahead. Real quick, you hit on the, the educating uh, your customers, like the house cap. Like we did that for Nochino. Um, when we first started releasing it, it, it was, I mean, I would say 95% of our customers have never heard of it. Um, and we, I think we've, We've been in production with it for like nine years now. And I mean, our Nochino before it goes in a bottle now is like four years old um, mm -hmm. or the whole process. And it's, but it's now our customers know about it. Um, local bars know about it. I mean, we would run into a lot, like a lot of bartenders that didn't even know about it when we started making it. And it's just that it, it is an uphill battle in regards to that. Like but our Apple liqueur, I had a, a sales rep tell me one time it wasn't sexy enough. Apples aren't sexy enough. And and I'm like, you're right, they aren't. But really, try it with some tequila or you know a whiskey, and it is phenomenal. But uh, it, it it's that you know commonplace, like kind of like the coffee liqueur comment that Andy made is, you know, an apple. It's a, it is kind of boring at sometimes, but when you try it in the right pre preparation or something like that, it has a lot of opportunity. And it's the education. Mm -hmm. From uh, the perspective of uh, other craft distillers listening to this, uh, can you share some insights or tips uh, that you found working with, you know, finding the, the nuts? I, I know, Ryan, you actually go out, <laughs> it's starting your backyard, right? Cut them down, yeah. use them or cut them down. And 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 Bev and Jonathan, I, I think, don't you have something where you, you have uh, people can donate uh, fruit, something like that? Oh, yeah. Well, we did that before COVID. We did it for three summers. And that was more just to as a charitable. Um, we did it. Um, just, you know, we have all these wild Himalayan blackberries around. And we just thought it'd be a fun way to get the community involved. And so they would bring in berries and then we'd measure them and then they got donated um uh to their favorite we donated two dollars a pound to their favorite charity and then when we finished the product then they got another two dollars per bottle and it was really fun you know the little kids coming in with berries and um and so when COVID hit that was kind of you know kind of difficult to do that but uh, we raised a lot of money for charity and it gave that opportunity to um offer a different flavor of blackberry because they definitely taste different than the berries that are grown for us by Gray's Marsh, um, which is a, um, a diamond, um, uh, black diamond. That was, yeah, yeah. It's a black yeah. diamond. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, it was a really unique taste because there was all berries coming from different places. So yeah. that was something we did for three summers. And it really hit home for people, I think, because the recipes for all our liqueurs are exactly the same. So we're always telling people it's the difference in the fruit that you're tasting. 
And then to have those two different varieties of blackberry and see how different that flavor is. Um, yeah, we've always kind of prided ourselves and and I'm probably you guys too that, well, we're talking about herbal liqueurs too. Um, I've never added from day one, there's nothing that gets added to the liqueur. You know, we all we care about is that the, the fruit is the star of the liqueur. And um, I think that's what's fun playing around with different varieties because it really comes out uh, in the boysenberry, especially. It's like the really different tasting um, and a very big difference in taste between the local picked, island picked, we call it, and um, our farm picked uh, berries. So. How do you all find the challenges of, of finding that right balance of, of sugar? Because I know a lot of people, when they first start out trying to make liqueurs, uh, they're, they're, they're almost like syrups, right? And and they lose that nuance. They're sweet, but yeah. they don't necessarily taste like that berry. So how how, how do you go about well, that? Well, it was kind of funny how we did, we did our first barrel of Wogenberry, and I literally did that and kept really good notes on that. And then I remember one of our wineries say, try to do that a second time. And fortunately, my husband is a great at formulation and Excel. So we have we have a formula, we have an exact formula, and it it's always changes based upon berries, sugar, you know, just different characteristics of what we're doing. So we have been able to get a really consistent flavor um, from our liqueurs. And um, and the other thing that we always really struggled with was filtration. I remember the first barrel that I bottled, it had a tiny bit of um, sediment in the bottom. And Steve says, no sediment, dump it back, filter it again. I did it again, still sediment. I'm like, isn't this good enough? And he bought this book. It was like $160 in in. in I don't know how old the book is. We call it the Bible. It's from yeah. like the fifties, and it and it says in there under liqueurs, um, you know, the, um, it is the should be as clear as the tears of Christ. Okay, or <laughs> something like that. And so he always goes. He comes in and he inspects all of our bottles, and if it's not right, we have to refilter. So yeah. that was one of the other things that we, you know, in this formulation is. Uh, filtration and it's that was not an easy thing to tackle <laughs> you know it kind of we're on the, experience <laughs> I, I would i would say kind of like we're actually a little bit on the other side of things where when we were doing our apple is we i had a winemaker is like oh you know we had uh it was cloudy there was some sediment and so we did um because i have a winemaking background as well we did do different microns and just kind of stepping it down and and we did get it just crystal clear and beautiful, but it lost so much flavor and body. Yeah, and yeah. so that's why I think depending on like the pectin levels and things like that of the fruit or um or herbs or anything like that, that uh, even you know that might cause a um a sediment or a louch of some type is important to kind of take in consideration. Um and then the, the other question was um like sourcing, I think it was earlier. We actually did the similar, like the blackberries. We we paid FFA kids um, before COVID and stuff to bring in and pick blackberries for us, and so we paid them. We weighed them out and froze them at the time, and <laughs> so uh, we did that as well. So, yeah. but um, then, what, Todd? What was your other question? I, I I think there was one I missed, and. Um, I think I asked about how how you pick out sugar. Or mm. how you decide sweetness yeah, yeah. and just making something syrup. Well, I think like when we started off, it was trying so many different products. And like with the Nocino, trying to balance um, the herbal bitterness, the herbal con different components to be able to shine through and not totally Americanize it and, and over sweeten it and, and things like that. It's, we, we tried, I mean, we, with all of the different liqueurs that and that we did purchase or end up making, looking at other products, trying them at bars, we buy little sample bottles or something like that to be like, all right, this is what is on the market. This is what the market is used to, if you would. Do we like it? What about it do we like? What about do we don't like? Um, and then taking consideration the quality of our fruit, the, I mean, there's, or, you know, different herbals, whatever we end up making, 
because we played around and worked with some other things and um, absinthe and such too. And but where, like, just kind of thinking about what are different, um, where we wanted to the end the end product to be. And for us, it was truly not too sweet to be uh, a little higher proof. So all of our liqueurs are probably higher proof than most that are on the market, especially the big brands. I think the craft brands tend to be a little higher proof as well. But um, it's to truly sh let that fruit, nut, if you would, coffee shine through and not over sweeten it. I mean, I think we have so much things in the market that are so sweet that it, they just outshine um, the raw material and just try to have that raw material come through and be the feature has been always for us the real more important part. Andy. Yeah, and for us, a lot of the liqueurs we work with or we make, the fruit that we're working with is not particularly sweet. Um, you know, we do quince, rhubarb, ascap, uh, nachino. Uh, so we're, uh, they're fruit that aren't associated really with sweet flavor. We do strawberry and that's probably the sweetest one. But um, the other fruits, they're they're known for their, you know, tartness or bitterness or astringency or, or flavors like that. Um, and if you make them into a pure syrupy kind of concoction, they become divorced from what makes them kind of special and interesting. Um, we, there's three of us, you know, involved in every batch of liqueur and uh, Sebastian, the owner has a very European palate. He would, you know, probably happily just eat raw cranberries. Uh, and I, you know, expect things to be a bit sweeter. So we kind of just meet in the middle. <laughs> so nobody's ever happy. Uh, no, uh, it is a balancing act. You you need a certain amount of sugar in it um, for cocktail sort of formulations. We make an apricot liqueur that's very much on the low side of sweetness for apricot liqueur. And it has a really intense apricot flavor. Um, and it works great in cocktails, but it can't be subbed in one for one with many other apricot liqueur brands because the sugar level is so much lower. Um, so it's a consideration for how you're going to market these things. You know, if you're truly looking to compete against another brand that has an established product in that space, you need some homogeny between the two or otherwise people have to reformulate all their drinks. Um, if it's something totally new, you know, you get to decide. Um, so like the Haskap liqueur is tart. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, and nobody knows differently because they've never had another one. So. Uh, Ryan, and this is kind of a jump off from the sugar question. Ryan touched on it about having alcohol uh, varying. Um, so what are some philosophies from the three of you of about, where the out where the ABV should be on some of these. I, I know like a lot of us are used to buying in the store, it might be 20 proof or something like that. So I know I know for us we did kind of what Ryan's talking about in the first, you know, in the very beginning, Steve and I created, of course, on Excel, because that's the um, you know, we put Grand Marnier, Kahlua, all the, the main brands and kind of looked at sugar and ABV and decided where we want to, and, and even that old Whidbey's liqueur that I was telling you about, and that's kind of where we came up with, we wanted it higher proof, just exactly like you said, less sugar and more very intense. And, and it did, it fell in this chart. It's like, this is where we're going to put it. Um, and that was, of course, to our taste, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, our raspberry liqueur is 23%. Ours is and, too. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then, like, our blackberry is 27 but I think, like, the raspberry, like, Chambord and the other big brands, I think we're, like, 16 It's 16%, yeah. And yeah. and that's significantly lower. We we always call ours uh, cocktail strength. Yeah. And um, and it's that way. It truly, to our customers, they can shine through in a cocktail. Yeah. Um, Real quick, I, I I almost forgot is because we're just finishing up a blueberry gin, um, and so we we debated is it going to be a blueberry a gin liqueur because yeah. for you know labeling guidelines or do we want to do a, a blueberry gin like they call it blueberry flavored gin, and 
But if we go the liqueur, the gin liqueur, the botanicals really got softened. And we lost a lot of what we were looking for in our, for our botanicals to shine through. And so we decided not to go that way. It's not too sweet. Um, and we did a blueberry flavored gin. And of course, that's the labeling requirements and as such. Um, and that way, it's not too sweet. Um, the botanical still shine through as a backbone of the structure. And that's what we're really looking for. It's a gorgeous, beautiful, sexy color. And you definitely know it's blueberry. Um, so kind of going back to one of your earlier questions that I talked about, like, you know, the sugar and such is um, your botanicals, if if it gets too sweet, a lot of depending on your botanicals that you have in the, if it's a raw ingredient or uh, accent item, they don't shine through as much, I don't think. Um, we're, we're approaching our, our time. So I, uh, I'd probably ask a, just a couple, couple more questions, but I think one thing that's on a lot of people's mind in, in the distilling industry as well is, uh, like sustainability and, and, you know, being a good steward uh, of your resources. Can you all talk a little bit about, you know, some of those things, how you've managed to work out with farmers or, or if, if you're growing it yourself, what are you doing? And, and, and that process. Yeah. That's a, I mean, that's a real challenge. You know, we've had to adjust every year. You know, we have, you know, Grace Marsh grows for us and, and sometimes we have boys and berries and sometimes we don't. And sometimes there's lots of Logan berries and no blackberries. And it is worrisome every year. I mean, it's, um, you know, we are farmers. I, I say, even though we're not growing it of ourselves, I, I think just like the farmer going, are we going to, you know, are we going to have our berries? <laughs> and we work craft distillery. So we use pretty much all of our product except for our sugars and our liqueurs, Washington grown. Um, most of it anyway. Um, and our berries certainly are. So all of our berries. So it's, it's constantly on the phone, just as backup too. And, um, yeah, it's, it's stressful. Uh, it's worked out so far, Yeah, you know, but there's always seems to be one or the other berry. And then we just do something a little different. And, um, you know, we, we've done a bunch of lavender liqueurs in our berries and that's been a, um, a really nice thing. So if we have a whole bunch of Loganberry just to add a second product, we can add some infused lavender in it. And then that kind of stretches that product and makes it so that we have a second product to offer. And we always look, we always try to look local and that's why we end up partnering with the lavender farm here on the island. And, you know, the fruit isn't exactly on the island, but we're, we're always looking to do that. And we even partner with local small farms and they take our grain and all our uh, fruit that after we press it off and then they feed it to sheep and pigs and things like that. So anything we can do, water recapture, we're constantly talking about the water coming out of our wells, our cooling water is completely recycled. So it's a closed system. So um, always looking at that stuff. Andy, you do anything down there in, in Oregon? Uh, you know, we do, but um it's it's being a very very small distillery um you have some limits on what you can do for sustainability you know from a packaging side from a shipping side you know in those aspects even if we radically changed everything so we just sold it you know out of a drum by the side of the road it doesn't really move the needle on anything um it's the sustainability aspect of it is like something large companies need to show the initiative on and address because they are the problem. Um, and we have things we can do. I mean, all the fruit resource is local. Half of it is seemingly picked by <laughs> us, uh, you know, but there's so much fruit out there in the Pacific Northwest. It's not, it doesn't feel that meaningful to me, it seems insane to get fruit from someplace else if you live in Oregon or Washington. Um, similarly, like we're distilling everything from scratch on our little still. Is that more sustainable or less sustainable than sourcing neutral spirit from a large plant? You know, it depends on which way you wear your hat, how you feel about that. So 
it's not a topic I spend a ton of time considering from the perspective of making liqueurs. Um, you know, we do what we can. We'd like to do more, but there's not really much more we can do in the space we have and with the levers we have to pull. So, <laughs> space. It, <laughs> it, it is true. If if you ever get a chance to visit Stone Barn, it is. I think <laughs> it's probably one of the smallest distilleries I've ever been in. We're probably um, second place. <laughs> bigger than <laughs> think. Uh, so we have three 1,000 square foot spaces, and then we have offsite barrel storage. So it, it seems small, but it's sort of like this unfolding tessel, uh, uh, <laughs> tesseract where there's a lot of the stuff jammed in all over the place. Like um, Optimus Prime, transform, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like four feet from the still right now because that's why I keep looking away because I'm doing a distillation right now. So I'll stay busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, why don't you all tell me about what is your favorite liqueur? And it it doesn't have to be your your own liqueur, but if it is, that's perfectly fine too. Um, just talk about what's your absolute favorite. I know mine. I mean, besides ours, I love Saint Germain. <laughs> I, yeah, mine the elder flower is quite. Yeah, wonderful. the elder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mine is actually the blackberry liqueur um, that we make. Good job, John. <laughs> I don't drink a lot of liqueurs, but I love Manhattans, and I've fallen in love with replacing the vermouth in Manhattans with the blackberry liqueur. It just has this depth to it, and it holds up well. And and so, when I'm making a cocktail at the end of the day. That tends to be what I'm making. And me too. I don't buy Saint Germain, <laughs> but I like it. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, I will definitely make that uh, one of my drinks for uh, for my upcoming uh, afternoon delight, right? So I'm going to yeah. try some blackberry. Yeah. Yeah, we do two ounces of the rye with one ounce of the liqueur, and that's it. Shake it up, put it in a martini glass. It's really good. Sounds delicious. I would say uh, mine is probably the Nocino. That we make it's been my kind of my go-to nightcap it's uh you know poured over the ice little orange zest or orange bitters the other one i mean this is a shout out to um uh who was it um guys over up in vancouver B, uh, bc um what was that sons of vancouver that's right sons of vancouver yeah, yeah. this is their um amaretto and this was just gorgeous wow. uh, you know, that they're, they're doing some really neat stuff. I remember meeting them, I think it was Proof a year or two ago. Um, but yeah, just kind of like a shout out to people that are doing different things. And that was just a really nice uh, expression of it. I really liked. Um, <laughs> so we make, uh, we have one orchard that grows almost all of our apples and pears. Um, and they also grow specialty cider apples. So they grow like French bittersweets, very high tannin fruit. Um, and we work with him to make a pomo, so like a fortified sort of an apple port. Um, or he makes cider, we distill it into brandy, and then the brandy is blended with apple must and barrel aged for several years. And that's probably my favorite. It's, it's about 18% alcohol. Um, it has no added sweetener to it. It's just the sweetness from the apple must, and it's pretty extensively barrel aged. Uh, I drink it a lot, and I it doesn't have our name on it. It has his name on it, so I like to bring it to anytime I get invited anywhere. I'll bring it because I don't have to talk about what <laughs> 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 pretend and enjoy, and, and everyone likes it. It's like perfect with cheese, perfect with nuts. It's it's wonderful before dinner. Pomo is tasty. Yeah. How about you, one? <laughs> I, I I made a pomo uh, when I was uh, distilling as well, and it's something that Americans uh, once they taste it, they're like, "Wow!" You know, and I think with so many liqueurs, it's the same thing, especially if they're made, you know, very well in, in the craft tradition, not just this sugary, skinny gal, whatever you would get at the big box store, um, but. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it's exciting uh, the potential that craft distillers have in just lightening up, you know, it, it, exposing people to different wonderful flavors. You talk about terroir. I mean, look, I, we're, 
you're all from the Pacific Northwest, so we're, you know, we're, but there's all across the United States, there's, there's interesting places that would have, you know, wonderful fruit. So I think it's, uh, it, it's fantastic. Um, I'm just going to finish up with, it's a, it's a little after 1030. I hope um, you've all enjoyed this. I've had a great time. Um, I, I just like to, uh, you know, first uh, just show my gratitude to you all uh, for coming together. And I think, uh, you know, it's something that I'm passionate about uh, actually going from, you know, making your base and sourcing the fruit, doing all those extra hard things. It shows and it proves, you know, you all have scores that prove that, right? It's just not a fluke. Uh, so I encourage other craft distillers out there to to think about it and uh, to take it to the next level. Um, but uh, if you could all just leave us with uh, kind of one parting word of advice about your distillery and 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 what you uh, do with the the liqueurs and any advice you might have for people uh, wanting to uh, maybe ditch the NGS and and go the the path less traveled. Um, and then we'll end with that. I mean, quickly for me, the one thing that these guys hear all the time, and I'll let Jonathan say something too, is consistency of experience. You know, that's the thing I learned from day one when I started our business is that consistency of experience for employees and for your customers is really vital and important. That every time they know what they're going to get, they know how long it's going to take when they come in have a tasting and how long it's going to take to get their product. And um, you know, I, I learned that from an old book that I read, read called E-Myth Revisited, which is a great book. And it talks about, you know, these, the consistency of experience. So. Yeah. And I would say if you're on the fence or thinking about getting away from NGS, um, always be thinking and, and trying to be creative. I feel like, for me, it would be really easy to say, okay, we have this, we have NGS, we put it together, slap it, and it's done. Um, but you lose some of that creative energy. We've come up with um, at least four different products because we're always looking at different things and, and uh, experimenting. And some of that, I think you know, goes by the wayside when you just have like, I know the this is going to be packaged up and ready to go and you do this thing. And, and it, and so you lose that and, and you lose some of the unique things that you might discover um, if you go the other route. So. I think utilizing, um, and this is what we've looked at is you have a, a base, but then utilizing even like a, a botanical of some type in that base while you work on the liqueur. So, uh, kind of Bev mentioned like the lavender, but to take a, a wheat vodka and utilize some type of a, you know, herbal infusion and then pair that with a, a fruit or nut or something like that. I think there's, it's just incredible opportunity for being creative. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is take meticulous notes um, in your formulations, making sure you understand true flavor profiles of um what you're working with. I mean, if you're working with barley, or if you're working with wheat or corn, knowing what the, the potential way that's going to go. I mean, I started home brewing, I think that my first home brew was I was 19. So, um, you know, when we started making whiskey, I had a good idea what grains were gonna do to my flavor profile. And uh, just being able to experiment and then try some new things is important. Yeah. Um... I guess, so my advice or my final takeaway would be if you're thinking about making a base yourself for the liqueur, um, you really want to think through why. Um, it's easy to just outright say, oh, I'm going to make everything from scratch. Um, but you really need to kind of take all the steps through that. You know, is there a tax incentive to do it or some sort of legislative or licensing aspect where you benefit from doing it? Is there a marketing aspect or a co-marketing um, angle that works? Or is there a flavor purpose? Um, you know, are you getting something unique from that base spirit that's contributing to the complexity and the flavor of your end result? 
I think some of the liqueurs that people formulate, the answer to all three of those is no. Um, and that might be a perfect place to look at sourcing something or using neutral spirit. In other cases, the answer is yes. Um, I mean, some of our liqueurs really benefit from having a custom flavor forward base spirit that we make here. Um, other ones maybe benefit less, but we've put ourselves into a paradigm of, of not sourcing. So it's not really something we even consider at this point. But if we were freshly starting, I think we might. Um, you know, it's, it's just a different world now than it is in, was in 2009. My other piece of advice about liqueurs is, is that it's all about the raw materials. Um, if you don't have something flavorful and unique to start with, you won't get something flavorful and unique when you finish. Um, if you don't have good fruit, you can't make a good fruit liqueur. Uh, part of And part of knowing what good fruit is, is understanding the properties of working with it. You know, what is the texture like? What is the acidity? What is the sweetness? What is the sediment like? Um, and once you really dive into those fruits, maybe how they're used traditionally, what sort of preparations they fall into, you get a better sense of how to work with them in the distillery. Maybe the fruit needs to be cooked. Maybe it needs to be evaporated and concentrated or frozen or all sorts of different techniques that become more apparent once you've handled a thousand pounds of them or whatever. That's my advice. It's so cool. Well, again, here, thank so. you. Thank you all so much. I can't um, express my gratitude and I hope that we can have you all back at some future point because uh, you all do a lot of other cool things too. So we, uh, we can talk about whiskeys or, or whatnot, but uh, uh, I really appreciate you all. Um, in the chat window, there was a link to fill out a quick survey. If people watching can complete that, I'd really appreciate it. And otherwise, just uh, stay tuned for more um, ADI EDU webinars. So thanks to all the panelists. I really appreciate you. And we'll uh, catch up with you soon. All right. Thank cheers. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.